Tonight we're going to be talking about what's my role, uh, membership sites in WordPress, and using roles and capabilities to manage workflow. How's the sound level? You guys hear me okay? Cool. All right. My name is Jim True. I am the support lead and community manager at the Pods Framework. It's a content management development framework for WordPress. Uh, that's our website, and that's my website. We'll come back to that again at the end, so you don't have to worry about it now. Okay, all the world's a stage, and all the men and women merely players from William Shakespeare. That is pretty much no different with WordPress. Every single person in WordPress has a role, just like an actor on the stage. WordPress comes with five built-in actors. They're the admin, the editor, the author, the contributor, and the subscriber. There's also two other little special admins, like in multi-site, you have a super admin. We're not going to be talking about him tonight. And if you're not logged in, there is a virtual uh, user called the guest. The guest basically has the exact same access as the subscriber, but they're not a user on WordPress. WordPress is at its heart a publishing platform, so its roles are defined from publishing and editing workflows. Uh, they're designed to basically provide that type of control over what users can do. So that's why they're named author, editor, contributor, and subscriber. Basically, your editor is like the guy at the top of the desk, and he said he handles all the, you know, he decides what's going to go in the newspaper and what doesn't. And he can defer, define, you know, which person, which author is going to be able to publish their stuff. The author typically can handle their own stuff. They actually work for the newspaper. They do their, you know, they do their articles, they publish their articles, they can delete their own articles and edit their own articles, but the editor can come in and also change them. Your contributor would be like a guest author. They can sit outside the business. And so they don't automatically publish their stories. Someone else has to publish their stories for them. And your subscriber is like someone who comes to a magazine and just reads it. And that's pretty much their only access. Uh, you manage the roles inside WordPress with capabilities. Uh, basically, users are given roles. So I can set up Elena as admin. I can set up Boo as an editor. I can set up you as an author. Uh, John as an author. Rick is an author. <laughs> Danielle is a contributor. She doesn't like it. She doesn't want to work with the newspaper. One of those kind of things. But I can give all of you guys roles, but what actually defines what you're able to do within WordPress is your capability. Uh, the capabilities define what you can do, see, edit, or interact with. Plugins that you install on WordPress also can use these capabilities to determine what you can do. Like some plugins actually say, um, does this person have the right to edit other users? So he must be an admin, so we're going to say, I'm going to give that person admin access. Uh, but they also can create their own public capabilities. And we're going to go into this a little bit. Uh, the WordPress Codex page, I've got a link here for you guys. It's very informative. It explains what every single one of the capabilities does. Uh, so for post and page handling, do you guys know what posts and pages are? All right, for post and page handling, typically you're gonna break your, your structure down into edit, publish, read, and write. Your admin obviously can edit all pages and pay, posts and pages. They can publish all posts and pages. They can read all posts and pages, and they can delete all posts and pages. Editor has pretty much the exact same access for posts and pages. It does not have the same access for the entire part of your site, but we're only talking about post and page handling right now. The author, can only post, can only edit, publish, read, or delete their own pages. The contributor can edit their own pages, they can delete their own pages, they can read all posts except private, but they cannot publish anything. Anything they publish goes immediately into review. The subscriber can read anything except private unless they're given access to read that private post. These actually look in WordPress like this. Kind of frightening. Yeah, edit posts, edit others' posts, publish posts, read private posts, read, delete posts, delete private posts, delete published posts, delete others' posts, edit private posts, edit public posts, and then we do the same thing with pages, and you get in there going, this is the code-based version of capabilities. It is really confusing, and it takes a lot of like reading those things and going, okay, what is that actually doing? And if you're trying to write some kind of a plugin, you have to understand this, but most of us aren't writing plugins. Most of us are actually working with WordPress and its content restrictions, and we're trying to work with basically how you need to work within a workflow with inside WordPress. 
So since this is really all confusing, wouldn't it be great if there's a tool to manage this? There is. It's called Members. Uh, Justin Tadlock wrote this really impressive plugin. It's free. Uh, it's one of my favorite plugins for uh, managing this in WordPress. And primarily because it provides a role and capability manager. Uh, it enables content permissions. So like if you're actually on a page or a post, you can say, this page or post can only be seen by authors. This page or post can only be seen by subscribers of my website. So if you're a guest on the website, you can't see it. That kind of thing. It also allows users to be assigned multiple roles. And we'll be getting into this why this is useful in a minute. It enables a login widget if you need it. Uh, it also can make a site private only. So like if you are creating an intranet site, or like I did a site for, I had my main website was jimtree.com, but I had a client access portal, and that was called clients.jimtree.com. That was a private only site, and I set it up with members. And basically when my clients logged in, they got a dashboard, and they could see their projects that I was working on for them, they could approve them or otherwise, and then leave. And it was a really good way to provide a workflow that the public couldn't see, but that that client could see and had a really good experience working with because of that. Uh, they can also open like a ticket for me, you know, create new change orders, that kind of stuff. Uh, all of the above is managed under settings members inside WordPress. So this is what the role manager looks like. We're gonna actually go into this too. I'm gonna do a real, a real honest to God, show you what it looks like. But the role manager inside Word, inside members actually breaks it all down for you. You can see all capabilities. You can actually see just the general ones that are WordPress based. You can see them at post pages. You'll see there that there's a pods and a pods fields. Certain plugins actually namespace their capabilities and you can actually determine uh, what access rights are given at that level. So it's really powerful. The grant or deny just basically means if you don't explicitly deny something and you don't, just, if you don't, if you grant it, it's there and it's yours. <laughs> but if you don't explicitly deny it, it will not be denied. Uh, Justin Tadlock has a really amazing readme file on the whole Rebels and Capabilities setup because this is a big warning. Anything you do in Rebels and Capabilities, regardless if you take that plugin off, it's still there. So I can go in and I can take the admin and I can remove every single right of their admin right here. I could just like go uncheck everything. And then if I, if I uninstall members, it doesn't matter. I have modified the database and I have hosed my WordPress site. So working in roles and capabilities is really dangerous. So this is gonna be a big warning there for that one. But what I tend to do is, if I'm coming up with a structure, if I'm trying to actually figure out what kind of role this person's gonna have, I never actually edit author, contributor, uh, admin, any of the, I never edit any of the built-in roles. I clone them. And then I take that new role and I give it new, new, new capabilities. And I narrow it down there because then I'm never touching the default WordPress ones. So I never break my WordPress installation. And I only give those roles to the client. Uh, typically, uh, I'm gonna give you another example here too. <clears throat> In pods, it's a custom post type. So with the custom post type, they're posts. So typically they mirror either post capabilities or they mirror page capabilities. So you're gonna have like edit posts, uh, delete posts, edit others posts, read posts, that sort of thing. If you set up the custom post type to have custom capabilities, I, and you let's say our custom post type is, um, oh, let's see, events. I would create it as edit events, uh, delete events, edit other events, publish events, that sort of thing. And then those particular post types, those particular capabilities only apply to that post type. And then I can actually go in and give those roles, those capabilities to a specific role. So I could have like an event manager, I could have a venue manager, I could have a, um, maybe I'm a, con uh, a person who publishes my concerts and stuff and, and you know, lists all the places I'm gonna be doing my shows at. That per the artist has the right, would kind of like, They'd be similar to a contributor. They can't publish them on the main calendar, but they can put them in there to be reviewed to be published. So I would duplicate their role to look like a contributor, and then I would go in and just give them access that mirrors that for events. This is what the content permissions editor looks like. 
It's a little screen that gets added to your post and page and allows you to actually, uh, you can kind of, can you see the test? Okay. Um, should probably use a little thingy here. It gives you a little table of the default roles that are actually in your system. I've added designer, dispatcher, <coughs> all the other ones are the regular built, built in uh, ones. But if I wanted to like have this page only be a, let's say it's a job queue for designers and it's just a list of all their work they have to do, or maybe it's a, a special thing that tells them what, you know, I don't know, like something, it's something specific for the designer, this particular piece of content. I could actually go in and say, this is can only be viewed by designer. And if it, anyone goes to that page on the web, uh, externally to the website, they won't see anything. They'll get the message that pops in down there or a default message that's in your settings uh, members. So you can actually explicitly hide content based on roles. So it's really quite powerful. Uh, it also has a short code interface here. So like within the body of a text, if you wanted to wrap a block and say that this paragraph here can only be seen by admins, you can go members access equals admin or an administrator and then put the text in between the short code and you're hiding it. Does that make sense? Yep. Start using my other mouse that won't work. All right. So, how is this useful? How is being able to manage roles and capabilities actually useful, you guys? Well, if you're managing users and their workflow, you can find plugins that work specifically with roles and capabilities. And you can use the back end to manage workflow and access for the people logging into it. So let's say, in my case, why are you the client intranet site? They could actually log in there, look at their projects, submit new jobs to me, submit change orders to me. And I was managing a workflow process within the WordPress back end admin. Um, usually when you're doing things like this, where you're managing users and workflow, it's all going to be on the back end. You're going to be using the WordPress admin to define and set up a workflow for your users. The other option versus <laughs> is using restricting content by user role. And this is when you're actually talking about using a membership site. Uh, typically, it's going to be an e-commerce membership site where they're going to pay a fee. You're going to give them a specific role that says you are now a member on my site at a specific level. And this is going to allow you to see content that I have hidden from the public that you are now paying for. And that's typically what a membership site is for. Um, typically, your membership sites are going to support drip content, which means they're going to give you like a sample, and then you have the ability to pay and see more stuff, which means that you want to have the ability to market drip content. You want to have the ability to tease with content. So either you're going to be showing like a first five seconds of a video, or you're going to be giving them the first chapter of a book, or you're going to be giving them something of that nature and entice them to pay at your membership site to see the rest of the stuff that's there. They're also going to um, member access to content. Yeah, that's what that basically I just said. <laughs> Once they pay for membership, that's going to give them access to the content that you've hidden. And you should be able to set up content levels based on subscri subscriber levels. Uh, and all of this is going to be on the front. Hey, guys, come on in. Hi. And I don't remember your names, but that's okay. I don't remember them. <laughs> You haven't missed much. Uh, there is food out there if you want, guys want it uh, from Publix. We have there's drinks and subtly sandwiches and stuff. So we haven't gone that far in. All you've really missed is the whole bit about roles and capabilities. But I'm recording this, so you can catch it at the you know when it up, when it uploads. Okay, your membership e-commerce sites. Some examples would be like video rental or virtual training websites, where they basically I'm going to let you see 20 seconds of the movies that we're going to have, and if you pay for a membership, you can actually see the whole movie. Uh, or you could be doing virtual training where you say, uh, I'm going to give you 30 seconds of you know, this boot camp routine, but if you want to see the whole Zumba blah, blah, blah thing over the next three weeks, watch that videos, you can buy membership into my website, and then you can see those videos. Or they could be yoga training, or they could be any kind of training. They could be training on this. <laughs> it could be giving you like the intro of the video and then you know you pay for a membership and you get to see the whole video. And uh, and that, I mean like, I'm using video as an example, but that could be just content, that could be documents. Um, it could be like club membership sites or private communities. Um, like you were talking about before, having a bowling league and they pay for a membership in order to do what needs to be done at that bowling league. 
or communicate with other members without having the entire internet see everything that they're typing. Uh, could be like online courses or, or coaching sites like lynda.com where you, you know, you, some of her sites, some of her classes are free and then some of her classes you have to pay a membership to be able to see. Uh, could be pay to read or use websites like uh, law or medical libraries. There's a, a really good example that one of the guys, one of the ladies did down in Miami. She had uh, accumulated all of this information about different diseases and treatments for every single animal for veterinarians. And it was basically this gigantic database of medical and treatment options for all different kinds of animals in a huge website. And basically, it wasn't open to the public, but vets would pay a monthly fee and then they could go into that system and search, okay, fixing uh, uh, abscess on a boa constrictor or, <laughs> you know, Removing, removing paper clip from turtle's nose or something of that nature, and they'd be able to find the appropriate treatment method for it. And so it was really useful. Uh, LexisNexis is a law library, and that's, what did I do that for? <laughs> it is a law library. Uh, LexisNexis is a law library that paralegals and most lawyers actually, read, you know, go, they have to pay to go into to be able to pull down like horse doc, case documents and case files and uh, legal precedents, and that would be an example of a pay-to-use website for content. Uh, and then, of course, premium support sites. I saw that one. I said, "Huh, it's pretty a good idea." Um, like any of these plugins, where you pay your annual yearly fee, you can't go in and use their premium support support forum or open tickets with them unless you pay that. That's a perfect example of a premium support forum. So. That's what all of these kind of, they're giving you some ideas of what membership e-commerce sites would be. Uh, so membership e-commerce requirements, if you're doing a membership site, it has to be able to support e-commerce gateway processing. It has to be able to handle payment. Uh, most of them, by default, handle PayPal, Stripe, and Authorize.net. Uh, if they don't handle those three, don't even look at it. It's not worth looking at. Um, has to be able to man have a user profile editor and account management. That is on the front end. That means you log in as a client, you pay for something, you can go in there and cancel your membership, you can change your address, you can change your level of membership, you can see what you've paid for. If it does not have that on the front end account profile editor, throw the thing away and don't look at it <laughs> because that is critical. You do not want to be doing this on a regular basis for your users logging in and fixing it. We did a, uh, we had to set up a subscription system or a, uh, what was it called? For Friends of Pods. We're a donation based uh, plugin. So our, we created this thing called Friends of Pods, which is like membership supported radio. So it's a membership supported plugin. We provide uh, discount codes on certain other plugins that are useful to developers if people pay us for a, you know, they, they join that Friends of Pods at a $25. Uh, a month level. And all of that reward distribution, all the membership cancellating and, and membership handling, was not built into the first system. It was all based on Gravity Forms and Caldera Forms and a gateway. And there was no actual membership handling in it. And it, it's a nightmare. I can't tell you how much work is involved in handling reward distribution and back and forth with the client when they don't pay their credit card bill and all that kind of stuff, it becomes overwhelming. So at a minimum, you have to have a system that can handle membership, access automatic, automatically generate emails if the person has suddenly stopped payment on their credit card or if their credit card declines. All of those things have to be inside your membership site. If they don't handle that, throw it away. It's not worth it. Uh, we end up switching to the WP, which is a donation-based plugin. I actually didn't mention about here. I'm sorry about that. For nonprofits and for people that are doing like donorships and campaigns for raising money and fundraising, GiveWP.com is phenomenal. It has uh, pretty much everything you need right off the box without paying for anything. It's completely free, but they have premium add-ons. So like if you need a MailChimp integration, that's a premium add-on. And there's a couple of other little uh, add-ons for it that are premium, but it's really worth it. I'm, I'm gonna add that to the slide when I do this again. <laughs> so I'll remind myself right now, again, I give WP to that. Um, but it's phenomenal because it gives you like uh, donor reporting. 
so you can actually see at a level how much money you're raising. And that's the biggest thing. Your membership site plugin should also give you complete uh, payment record reporting so that you can actually see your income levels and stuff like that and how much your monthly are going up and down. And, and, you know, and you can, so you can anticipate, is this working for me? Am I making the money I need to make? Uh, it needs to be able to handle drip content delivery. And that means all the teasers all the content where you give them 30 seconds of a video or, 30, or the first chapter of a book or something like that. That's not quite what There's two different things. Drip, drip content design so that when you join, yeah. you can't download everything in the site. Right. And oh, quit. Thank you. Drip yes. content lets you get maybe 10% of it the first two weeks. Ah, so more okay. the second two weeks. And by the time you get access to all of it, you've been a member long enough where they're not really worried. Okay, let me reconfirm it because I'm not sure if it's going to hurt it if it got if I could hear that on here. So I'm going to repeat that. Your content delivery. Thank you, John, for that clarification. Is to prevent people from taking all of the content that you have restricted by membership and getting it all at once. It makes sure that they only get so much based on membership level at a certain amount of time. Thank you. Because like on Lynda.com, I can watch every single video they have. If I pay for membership. Every single video, I can look at all of them, and I can download most of them, I think. So uh, the email marketing tie-in for drip sales, and that, that's what I was actually thinking of, was the drip, that other kind of drip, too, the, uh, where you basically, if someone has signed up a, as a sample to get like a little bit, or they've downloaded a free chapter, drip sales is you keep hitting them up for more information, and you know, they kind of like, like, hey, you want to? Possibly do some work. <laughs> you know, at staged amounts, you get like little emails that go out at specific times. It also handles expiring notices and invoices, which we just talked about. Uh, it needs to handle have easy to manage content permissions. So you should very easily be able to say that these particular things belong to that particular membership level, etc. And it needs to have, uh, and this is for you when you're hosting a membership site. It needs to be on good hosting. I'm not going to talk about that tonight, but. Uh, good hosting just means make sure that you're not on a completely shared server where someone else's resources are going to yank your website down. Uh, and you need to have an SSL secure certificate. You absolutely have to um, if you're going to be doing any kind of secure e-commerce. Because in that little nice little lock isn't up there in the, in the browser, people are going to go away and they're not going to buy anything from your site. So the best uh, membership site for doing easy to set up, uh, pricing login, sign up, and thank you pages, built in access control, content dripping, and some pretty good reporting too is MemberPress. Uh, I'm doing <coughs> most of this review from WP Beginner. Uh, he did a review just recently, like about two months ago, and went through and actually rated several different uh, membership site plugins. Since these are premium, I can't buy them and go test them, so I'm, I really had to go from review sites and checking out their information. Uh, this one looked very rock solid though. And easy to set up. And that's the other part of it too, is like for $119 a year, uh, that's for one single site, and it's $239 a year for uh, unlimited sites. If you're gonna be paying that much for a membership site, you should be able to have a money back guarantee within like 30 days at least, or something of that nature. So like if you pay for it, I can get my thing back. If they're not giving you a demo to play with, you need to be able to at least make sure that you get a money back guarantee. And uh, most everything about that one was rated really well. It only handles three payment gateways, though. It handles Authorized Net, Stripe, and PayPal. Those are uh, built into it. And um, it does not have any add-ons for any additional payment gateways. So if you were dealing with international clients, you might run into a problem there. For, uh, now this is a different one. If you had, if you're providing digital downloads, this is probably your best solution. It's called Restrict Content Pro. It's written by the people that write Easy Digital Downloads and uh, Affiliate WP. And it's a very solid website. Uh, they give you a lot of power on the basic setup, the $99 method, which I think is a one-site installation. Uh, you get a lot for that. It has uh, Stripe and Stripe, PayPal, and Authorized Net built in at that level. And then they have add-ons to add additional ones on. They have add-ons for a lot of different stuff like connections to WooCommerce, connections to Affiliate WP, connections to uh, other uh, email marketing systems and stuff like that. Um, they have some of the best support 
Uh, they, they actually really have like a, a large team of people that just like responds within a day. So they're not a bad choice either if you were looking at one. But that one I would look at if you're going to be the giving digital downloads, like uh, content that people can download, and restricted content. And this one, if you're doing course management of any kind, this is hands down the best plugin for doing that. Uh, it's a learning management system. It's a LMS, a learning, learning, learning management suite, which means that it's designed specifically for creating courses, uh, drip, con drip content, like you're talking about, where you're basically a class is given to you, and you get the content for the next course after you finish the current course, and then the next course, and then the next course, and then the next course. Um, it has you know student enrollment certificates. All of that little pieces are in there, built-in forums for communities to actually communicate on the back end. It's a very powerful plugin. It's $129 a year for a single site or $300 a year for unlimited. Uh, USF uses it. That should give you a pretty good little right there. Okay, how do you choose? If you're only providing content restriction, member press. If you're also selling digital goods for download, restrict content pro. If you're setting up an entire online course curriculum, including enrollment, scheduled courses, certificates of completion, et cetera, learn dash. Uh, the more pros and cons are listed on that link right there at the Web Beginner. WP Beginner's five best WordPress plug membership plugins compared for 2017. Okay, now we're going to talk about using WordPress to manage workflow. And this is when you use the back end admin of WordPress to actually build an application around what the client needs to streamline or simplify, the, simplify their business processes. So you're going to be using roles and capabilities to determine what the people can do and what they can see. You're going to be using the dashboard to give them specific reporting or uh, specific access. You're going to be changing the admin menus and you're going to possibly be using custom post types to actually build a process that people will be logging into the website to do. And uh, workflow management sites, some examples, uh, project management or a job queue process. So uh, if you've got like an entire team of designers and they all need to log in and figure out what you're all working on right now or an agency, that might be an option there a support ticket system or a help desk, a lead generation or a CRM. I used a local installation of WordPress as my customer relations management database forever. I had it tied in with Gravity Forms and MailChimp and I basically used it to start the lead generation would come in through my external website that would immediately start them into my personal CRM because I couldn't find a CRM that I liked. I hated all of them. They were all too over, overblown like Salesforce is like insane. Um, and it just, it helped me, you know, manage them the way I needed to manage them. I could leave notes to myself. <laughs> it was wonderful. Uh, appointment management. If you are a, um, you know, massage therapist or something like that, maybe or you're doing a site for a massage therapist or maybe a salon, and uh, you want to actually provide more functionality to that client than just doing a website, you want to actually create an appointment calendar in the back end for it. Most appointment calendar plugins, if they're good, will actually have a back-end admin, but it may not be a clean or good-looking one. And that's one of the things you can do as you know, a web WordPress developer is provide more value over what the plugin can do. Uh, property management is a good one. Um, I actually pitched this to Terrier Properties because they have, what, I think a thousand properties they manage in St. Pete, downtown St. Pete, uh, Old Northeast, Old Southeast, stuff like that. So these are basically little houses that are, you know, little, little one bedroom here, or seven bedroom here, or 15 bedroom or 15 apartment units and stuff like that. Well, we were renting them on a regular basis. Every 20, 20th of the month or whatever, people suddenly want to like, you know, that's when everybody wants to find a new apartment because that's when most leases are ending. So like I wanted to, they had nothing for rent when I was looking one time, but I, want, I was interested in this place, this place, and this place. So I said, well, why don't you guys list all your properties? Give me a button so I can click and say, I'm interested in these seven properties. And then contact me first when those leases come up in those properties. And I said, you know how easy that would be to set up? And how much more, how much amazing work you would be getting? You, know, it's like, you would be like contacting people and telling them, hey, yeah, <laughs> you're, you're on the waiting list already. So you know, basically, that's all you're doing is adding people to the waiting list. And that's a property manager. Uh, the possibilities for creating back-end workflows and increasing the value that you have as a WordPress developer 
to your clients are limitless. Seriously. We're going to plan a sol now we're going to plan a solution. In this case, we've got a dispatch, uh, a designer, and a manager. And in coming in or coming in from outside are jobs coming in from the client. That dispatcher is going to get those jobs and she's going to assign priority and enter them into the system and then she's going to route them to design. Design is going to pick up the job and add their design to it. Then he's going to add some notes to it, you know, the date he completed it and some additional notes. And then he's going to route it to the manager for approval. The manager is going to approve or reject the design, add notes and comments, and then route it back to dispatch. So you're basically creating a job queue system. This is kind of what we're doing here, planning a solution. So the tools I would use to manage that workflow, members plug in for roles, for job roles. You know, to assign specifically a dispatcher, a designer, an approver. I'm going to be using my pods plugin to actually create the custom post types for clients and job queues. I'm going to be using Admin Columns Pro, which is a, all of these have a link behind them, by the way. So when you download this, when you visit the slide, you'll be able to click those links and go directly to those plugins. Admin Columns Pro is a plugin that allows you to take the table and actually add additional columns into it based on your custom post type. You can add like a featured image and actually show it in there. You can add more information about the taxonomy. In the case of our their uh, most current plugin, they've actually integrated completely with our pods plugin to show our relationship fields and allow inline editing and sorting and filtering. And I'm gonna show you guys this one. Um, here's an optional one is client dash. I checked out this plugin and I was like really blown away. Um, it kind of replaces the entire dashboard based on user role and gives you this entire thing that says, you know, for, you know, you can actually create little blocks that say, this is what, go here for this, go here for this report. It's, it's, it's very powerful. It took me a bit to look at it. I'm going to be checking it out again, but I don't have uh, any demos for that one tonight, but I'm, I had to mention it because it's very powerful. Uh, I really liked its admin menu editor because it basically, you know, how the admin menu has like your posts, pages, media library, tools, blah, 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 all the way down the side. It imports the menu in based on the user role. And then you go in and say, take that off, take that off, take that off, drag that up here, drag that down there. And it saves that menu per user role. Love that. That's the best way to do that kind of editing. I was really impressed. When you say that, client dash? Yeah, with the client, uh, client dash. So you could have different menus for different groups of people? Yes. Instead, like admin eyes and admin menu editor, kind of do that, but not really well. Their interface is lousy. I was really impressed with the interface on this one. It was probably the best looking interface I'd ever seen for managing the menu, the dashboard menu. Okay, not the menu on pages. Not the front end menu, only the back end. Just, is there something that does the front end menu? Yeah, I mean, your menu editor? No, 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 for different groups of people. Uh, so that, you know. I know what you're talking about, providing like a different menu based, based on different roles. They're logged in, but they're only subscribers. They see a different menu. Does That's, this show you know, I should have looked for that. I should have looked for that. I didn't I think about it. Things and yeah. then deny them the ability to do it when they go there. Right. If they don't see the menu, then obviously they wouldn't go there because so of the option. There, then they don't. So you're thinking of having a, a front end menu that's that's configurable based on user role. Yeah. Okay. Jim, make a note <laughs> to look that one up. Okay. okay. Uh, WP Help um, is by uh, Mark Jackwith. It's a custom post type integration, but it takes that help screen with Inside WordPress, the one that's available up there, and allows you to provide context specific help inside the WordPress system. And you can even sync it in the cloud, etc. It's really nice. Uh, Tabify edit screen. Uh, if you've ever noticed, like if you install way too many plugins and you go to the post editor, you've got the SEO box, and then you've got your categories and taxonomies over here, and then you've got like your standard post bit, and if you add in pause and you start adding all those additional fields, you've got so much stuff on there that the client is going, <laughs> which is why I've been getting so many requests by so many people saying, I need to create a form that publishes all my stuff on the front end because I'm not letting people log into the back end. Well, Tabify, Admin Pro, Admin Pro Client Dash, all of these little things are designed specifically to strip away things that that role doesn't need to see. So you can actually hide all the SEO crap from people that don't need to see it. <laughs> because if I show that to my client, they're gonna obsess over it, and they do. 
uh, if you're doing SEO for your client, you need to see it. Or if you've got someone that you're actually using at their agency, like a marketing person, they're handling the SEO for that client, so they need to see it. But the client doesn't need to see it, typically, because they're going to be overwhelmed by it. So Tabify actually allows you to go in and say, I want to take that tab and put it on its own tab, but I, only, I want to make that tab only be seen by a specific role. It's very powerful. And it's free. Uh, Widget Builder hasn't been updated in a while, which kind of freaked me out, but I love it. I haven't found anything that actually does exactly what it does. Widget Builder, I'm sorry, I'm standing in front of the whole thing right now. <laughs> Widget Builder allows you to create pages that are widgets. So you can actually create this whole thing that has like an image with a link and you can add like text in there and you can do like all your little content and you can say make this a dashboard widget or you know, make this something that I can just put in anywhere on the, like if, you, uh, let's say it's like a repeatable piece of content, maybe it's a call to action, and you write it as a, as a WordPress type page in Widget Builder, and it becomes a call to action that you can put wherever you need to put it as a widget goes. So it's very powerful on that side, but I typically use it for dashboard because I want to put like a welcome message on every single dashboard when I turn a client site over. I want this welcome message that it says, Here's how you contact me, here's my phone number, here's my email, here's my support ticket, blah, blah, blah. And it allows them to have very informative stuff right there. Um, I'll show you an example of that on my, uh, my local website where I do my pet sitting, because I've used the dashboard widget for that. Okay, workflow demos, as many as we have time for. <laughs> so, where are we at anyway? Seven o'clock, how are you guys feeling? You flagging? <laughs> okay. Got any questions while I'm getting things started? Oops, that's not my mouse. <laughs> that's not my mouse. Okay. All right, I'm gonna go in the admin of the local website here. So you can see I have clients and I've got jobs. I've added these with pods, um, which I'm not gonna go terribly into detail with, but you'll notice this doesn't look like a typical table for WordPress. You've got client types, related jobs, you know, some additional information on here. If I go in and look at the, let me see what view is this. My classes are not working today. Oh, this is the client site. Let me see. Jobs is the one that I did the most work on. Okay. This is my job queue that I created for graphic design jobs for my uh, clients. The dispatcher can actually, this is what the dispatcher's view looks like is here. So they see, you know, the job, who to assign it to, uh, the client, is it approved or, has, or is it complete? Um, so if they want to, if they're working in here, let's say this one is actually, this one has not been, none of these jobs have been approved. So, but, well, let's see, is the job, uh, this job's complete. So I'm going to actually route that over to my administrator, who's my approver in this case and it's automatically saved. Uh, I can actually go in here and say, oh, that's the wrong client. Let me change that. That client is actually Elaine's Tees. <laughs> so, and this actually allows you to work a workflow from the table admin. So let's say if you actually had a gravity form for your uh, clients, and the clients actually sat there and filled out a gravity form, and they actually pushed in you know, details about a new job says, hey, I want to change a new logo, or I want to change the color on our website because I don't like the color it's going right now, or I need this or I need that, that would come in as a job. It'd pop into jobs unassigned. So let's actually create one. We'll just do that now. We'll just fake it. <laughs> um, change the color on our website. Hey, okay. pick color. Needs to be purple and green. <laughs> no designer is going to ever do that. Uh, this is coming in from the client, but since we don't actually have the client in here, we're just going to leave it like that. It's not assigned to anyone right now. The client in this case is Lou Sandwich. And that's it. Okay. So we're going to publish that. Our dispatcher, actually let's switch to the dispatcher. Oops. I guess I gotta log in. <laughs> if I do that, let me tell you. Yeah. That was probably not the way I wanted to swap around. I, any questions out there while I'm figuring out what I'm doing here? 
the back end is admin columns pro uh, it's expensive unfortunately it's like a I think it's like 200 a year or 139 a year but that's for unlimited sites so you can put that on every single site you work with it's one site and you've paid for it. If you've built something useful for a client, you roll that into your installation fees and that just becomes part of the, the license. Um, being able to streamline their work, I'm actually gonna log it as me and go back into the user. I'm using a plugin called User Switcher. And if I go into Users and pick up Sally Dispatch right here, I can switch to her. There we go. Now I'm seeing her desktop. Okay, so she's got a much limited desktop. You know, she's not seeing some of the other, obviously she doesn't see pods. Uh, and her view is automatically set as the dispatch view and she can't change it. So this, uh, you, you see that there's no edit columns up there and there's no view list. But I can go show me everything that's empty. Filter. Okay, so this one is not assigned to anybody. So I need to assign this to my Designer. I'm going to assign that to Bob Designer. Yes, it's Lou Sandwich. And I'm done. So get out of inline edit. So now I'm going to log in as the, as the designer. Uh, let me go switch my back again. Switch back to Jim True. And then I will switch back to. This is probably not the best way to, to, to show this, but I'm doing a demo of this uh, for our website on pods to talk about Admin Columns Pro. And this is. I'm going to use to explain it and I will edit that down and I'll give you guys that link so that you can actually see a good example of this as opposed to this kludgy one that I'm doing right now. <laughs> so I'm going to switch and log in as Bob Designer. He goes into jobs and he sees this view which is the default view for him and the approver. And you can see that this uh, change the color on our website is open so he's going to go in there and inline edit and it's assigned to him. He has two jobs assigned to him. Uh, Actually, let's filter that down. Assign to, yeah. So he's gonna knows he's got two things. Looks like the sandwich appears on balance, smaller bun or less bread. So I need to get a new picture here on that one. So that's why that job is coming back to him. Uh, so this one, he's not really gonna be, I'm just gonna add an image here. And now I'm done, so I'm gonna say, I am, I don't have a checkbox for him. Okay, but I can route it to the, I can route his job to the admin at this point. Now if I switch back to Jim True, which is the admin, I'm gonna look at the stuff that is waiting for approval and I need to change, um, you know what? We need to change this column. We need to actually create an approver view that actually gives the picture in here. So I'm gonna go into edit columns and we need to add a column in here. So we're gonna go add column, and we're gonna add the default featured image. That's one thing I do typically with WordPress custom post types. If the job or the thing only has one image, I always use the featured image because that image is attached to the post at the top level, and I don't need to add another field for a gallery. I don't need to add another field for anything else. That image applies to that. So like if I was having a, a, like for most of my clients, I had one field that was their logo. And that's where I would put that field. Their official logo was always there. Now I always had like their job file, but each job file had one image on it, typically, because what each job was one thing I was editing. So I always use the featured image for that particular thing. If I'm using featured image here, I'm going to select that. It will automatically show it as a thumbnail. I'm gonna allow online inline editing and say update and I'm going to drag where that field is actually because I don't want it there. I want it at the front up here. There we go. So this is, uh, I'm going to create, I'm creating a new set is what I'm doing here basically. Um, I just realized I'm modifying dispatch aren't I? Oh, settings for dispatch, that's okay. <laughs> we'll use dispatch. If I was doing this as a proper uh, job flow, I would have one view that was assigned for the dispatcher, one view that's assigned for the designer and what columns they can edit, and one view specifically for the approval that says what columns they can edit and what columns they need to see. Does that make sense? Because okay. the idea is, is that when they log in, 
that table gives them the view that they need to be able to do their work. And they only want to be able to edit and do the things that they need to be able to do with. So, so in this case, I probably would be creating a brand new view, but I don't think I have the ability to duplicate one. And that would be a problem. <laughs> so I'm going to add that as a ticket to those guys as a feature request. Because I should be able to like take the dispatch view and duplicate it or base, like if I wanted to add a new set here. Um, oh, here you go. So we're going to call this one approver view. We're going to select the roles. In this case, we only want the administrator to see this one because we're going to give them a little more access, right? In Admin Columns Pro, you can actually do it by role or you can do it by user. So you have both options. It does not have capabilities there. So if I add this new column set, and it's actually based off of, oh, okay, so it did duplicate it. That's fine. But what I want to do is, is I want to make sure this is not inline edit anymore, because it doesn't need to be. And those are probably it. Ah, this needs to be inline edit. Yes. So I need to change the job approval status to be able to edit that because the approver is going to approve the job, but they're not going to mark it complete. So the approver needs access to approve the job, but they don't need access to mark it complete. Only the dispatcher can do that. So close and update. Now this will make more sense in like three seconds. <laughs> We're going into, I'm Jim True, so I'm going in as the approver now. Okay. So I have, oh, I have three jobs assigned to me at the moment. My goodness. Yes, I like that picture, so I'm going to approve that one. And oh, I didn't give them a note column. Hang on. Got to add one more column in here. I'm going to lose modified. I'm going to lose date. And I'm going to add notes. Uh, pods. With the pods add-on, you can actually pick out your actual columns that are, have been added to pods, and it'll recognize the type of field. It'll recognize uh, the label for the field and automatically replace it. So like when I opened that up, it said pods and pods. When I changed it to notes, it changed it to the label for that particular custom field. And I want to give this one inline editing. Okay. Close. And update. Now if I go back in to view my jobs, I have a note field and I can say that's a coffee cup. Purple and green are hideous. Advise client no. <laughs> Ugly color combination. And then I'm going to route that back to dispatch. Now, the idea would be is that you could add an action hook at the end of your job, of your post save routine, that when the approver is done with something, they could actually change the automatically assign it to the next person in the queue. But for right now, we're doing it manually. So I'm going to assign it back to dispatch. But the goal would be is that you automate this part so that the routing is automatically handled for them. And in this one, I like that one. So I'm going to approve it. Oops. Hang on. And I'm going to route that back to Sally. Okay. So now if I switch off again and log back in as dispatch, and we're assuming, when I'm using the user switcher, we're assuming I've logged out and I've logged in as somebody else, okay? Because I'm actually Sally Dispatcher up here now. If I go into the job queue, she can see... Whoa! <laughs> Hang on. How did I do that? Yikes. Sorry about that, guys. Actual size. <laughs> My apologies. I had no idea that the Mac did that. Uh, you guys are being awfully quiet. 
<laughs> so this job is approved. So she's actually going to go in and mark it complete and let the client know and provide the details onto the client. Um, this one's also approved. So she's going to do the same thing there. And those two jobs are done now. Yeah. So would you set up uh, emails to be sent out when the job is approved? You could. You could. You that, ah, good question. <laughs> um, there's a couple options on that one. It depends. Um, you know, triggering stuff automatically is one of those kind of things that you have to look at all your hooks. And that's why, like, typically in this kind of a situation, I probably, while I like this kind of a system, I would probably end up doing gravity forms for a dispatch flow because I could automatically trigger emails based on conditions changing. Does that make sense? Yeah, because I would actually go, I would have like a form that I could say, as I change the person and route it, you know, as I, as I approve that checkbox, it automatically routes it. If I'm dispatcher, it automatically routes it to the client, back to the client with an email sent that it's done. So are you familiar with gravity? Yeah, I have, yeah. That's, is that what you're talking about, or are you talking about just doing it? You can do it in gravity flow, but you could also do it in gravity forms too. Yeah, there's, it's like post-processing. It's like, there's a lot of stuff you could do as actions conditional on the back end. I don't like, um, I think Gravity Flow uses only their entry system, or do they actually create custom post types? Yeah, I, I, wish, um, I wish our Gravity Forms guy was here. He would know, because uh, we have a guy local. Uh, he's in Newport, Richie. Is that right? Um, Travis Lopez. Yeah, Travis works for Rocket Genius. Um, and uh, Lopez. Uh, Travis, <laughs> if he sees the video. Uh, we might want to do a thing on Gravity View. Might not be a bad idea, Gravity Flow. He has a pl plugin called Gravity View, um, and he has a lot of little plugins that he has that are specifically Gravity Form related. We have a plugin that is called uh, pod, a Gravity Form's add-on for pods, and it actually will publish your post directly into pods. Uh, you can do some other actions and stuff, and you can, you can use the Gravity Form hooks to create other actions that would happen based on conditional responses. So like, if you change the value of something, you could initiate another email to go out based on those kind of things. So that's Admin Columns Pro. Um, let me show you, did I activate my own local site? Where are we at, 718? I think we're okay. Let me fire up my Jim True local here. Start. Oh, and for, since we didn't actually get to do it while we're doing this, I will switch back to Jim True and I'll show you the uh, admin, uh, sorry, the role editor. When you're in users, um, admin, I'm sorry, members plugin actually adds this new thing called roles. And you can see each of the roles that are available on your WordPress installation. And what I like is, is you've got the ability to clone a role. So like if you wanted to go in and clone the administrator, and then create a new version of the administrator, you could do that. Uh, it also gives you the ability very easily to add multiple roles to the same user. So like I can go into dispatch and let's say, today my dispatcher is actually a dispatcher and a designer. Boom, done. <laughs> it's that simple. So that's one of the main reasons I love uh, members because it's, it's very easy to work with. But going into their role editor, let's take a good look at that one. Because um, I didn't get this pan all the way down the page there. You've got like all the capabilities that are on your website at the moment and you're gonna, ah, that's too much there. I don't know what all that does. <laughs> it's very confusing. So they provide this really nice interface for breaking it out into its little areas. So like editing the dashboard, editing files in the media manager, uh, the export import, which is your WordPress tools, export import, uh, manage links. I, I don't think the links man menu is anywhere in WordPress anymore. So that's that old capability still sitting around there. Manage options, like your theme options and stuff like that, your customize. Uh, moderate comments, so like when comments come to your website. These are all those extra little capabilities. I know what a lot of these are, but not what all of them. Update core. Uh, you can actually control which users are allowed to do maintenance updates on your WordPress installation. So you could actually set it so that your clients have access to do the things they need to do, but absolutely cannot do that, <laughs> you know, if you don't want them to, or update plugins for that matter. Uh, there's the standard post capabilities, the pages capabilities, media, upload files. You can turn off the ability to upload files. 
so that all they can do is manage what's in there. Um, in pods, we have the ability to, this basically is what gives them access to the pods admin uh, here, is what these two little guys do. The taxonomies, you can change it so that people cannot actually add new categories to your category list or tags. Uh, you can make it so that they can't add themes. So they can't touch any themes and add new themes to them. That'd be wonderful. Uh, you can turn off the ability to update plugins. You can turn off the ability to update themes. And inside users, you have all of these lovely things. You can turn off add users, and etc. So it's pretty powerful. Um, and of course, custom capabilities, which are all the things that are not in there that didn't they didn't namespace their capabilities. So like man manage admin columns is a non-namespace capability, which means that it wasn't, when they wrote it into their plugin, they didn't say, I am an admin columns plugin. <laughs> they just wrote the capability in there. And we have a handful of those too. And we hide them here because we don't want people touching them. Uh, so that's, that's that kind of stuff. So that is my look, that web stuff. Let's go into Jim True Dev. Could you create a, System admin that you could enter or add users that could only delete or edit users that they had created, not that some Hang other on. system. Uh, let's see. Let's see. You can add users, create roles, create users, delete roles, delete users, edit roles, edit users, list roles, list users. You'd have to write a new. They're all universal. If you Those are all. You, you would have to. User, you could edit every. You have to, you would have to, thank you, that's a good question. His question was, was uh, could you create a supplemental admin that could only manage the users that they had added? No, but you could create a different capability. Um, I had to do this for a specific website where it was a franchise website. So that you had the franchise manager, you had a regional manager, you had franchise owners, and then you had people that worked at that particular franchise that this person managed. So what I ended up doing was, they had the ability to edit all users, they couldn't see them all. You hid the ability to see all users based on them being attached to a kitchen or a franchise. So like I could assign a lane to a specific franchise. I extended users is what I did. I added a user meta field for that franchise. And as a franchise manager, I had the ability to see that field so I could modify it. And I went in and changed it so that Elaine was, a lot, you know, this particular person was assigned to that kitchen. And that particular kitchen manager could edit users, but they could only see the users that were assigned to that kitchen. And that's how you would handle that. You'd modify user meta, change the filter view, change the view of the tables so that only specific things are visible to them. You, you would have to actually add some hooks into the uh, table for users to uh, like to the pre get post filters or I don't know where they would those would be hiding at they're one of the filters in there for WordPress to strip out what's visible okay yeah that's not built into WordPress but it's in there somewhere yeah but yes it's possible to do stuff like that because that's how I managed it I wanted to make sure that this particular franchise could see all the people that were signed up at that franchise the regional manager could see all the kitchens that were assigned to their region and manage them and see the accounting and everything flow up. Not another region. And the franchise manager can see everything. So and me as an admin, I can see everything. So yeah, it's possible, but not with the default built-in WordPress role or capabilities. But you can add a capability, and that's I think that it's been a while since I did that project. I added a capability, is right. what I did. So and that's how I used it to filter the list. Good question. Very good question. So this is my local website. Uh, this is when I moved over to off uh, Bluehost to WP Engine. I had to put my real website out, but I had to lose my project website, which was the one that used to be out there on the net. But it was a client site because I didn't want to spin off another uh, staging site. So I just did this locally because I wanted some place to host it. It has my old CRM, so all of this stuff is basically my client list from, um, you know, using using pods, uh, and I got conditional you know, filtering and stuff like that so I can see which ones are my active clients. And then of course, if I go into a client list, I've got their picture, I've got their information. Don't look at all that stuff. No. <laughs> anyway, but 
it's all their, you know, login information for their GoDaddy and, you know, their registrations and stuff like that. But for the other thing I needed to do was I needed to have the ability to uh, track my upcoming pet sitting because I do dog and pet sitting. So I have this little view that's basically the upcoming pet events. Well, on the dashboard, I wanted that on the dashboard because I thought it was more useful there. I don't want that on the front page of my website. So I've got upcoming pet sitting. I did this with Widget Builder. It's this awesome little, I mean, it's so easy to use. That's the thing I think I liked about it the most is it was just, it's in your appearances, Widget Builder. You go in here and it's just like creating a page. There's no styling. That's the biggest thing. You have to, any styling you're going to want to do would have to be something that would either be at the admin level style sheet or a theme that overrides the admin level style sheet or within the particular dashboard panel itself. So in this case, all it's really doing is calling uh, event calendar, the event calendar short code to list the events that are coming up that are upcoming and just, I want to see 15 of them. But over here, I can tell it, I want this available as a dashboard widget and I don't want it on the sidebar. So I could actually create a special message to my clients uh, and you create a widget here and then it becomes available as a dashboard widget. So it's one of those I really like. It was, it was quite easy to use. Um, let's see, any other plugins or ideas you guys would like to see like that? The, the did, thing I did notice though was that if I use plugin widget builder, client dash slammed into it and like did this ugly thing. So, <laughs> and I think I have client dash. I do have it installed. So I'm going to deactivate widget builder and I'm going to reactivate client dash. And I'm going to show you what it can do. It kind of replaces the dashboard with this insane <laughs> so you have your account screen your account profile screen your help for your documentation any reporting that you might want to do and this is the webmaster but you can actually define each of these little areas and the icon for them you can make them go to a specific page inside your web page websites so you can actually go to a uh, you know a, a content protected page that is uh, a list of reports for the management, and that would be what that report make would go to. But that allows you to basically take like the whole back end and modify it. Their menu editor is incredibly powerful. That was the part I wanted to show you guys. And that, this is what Widget Builder? No, this is Client Dash. This is Client Dash. Widget Builder and Client Dash like went ah! <laughs> because Client Dash takes over the dashboard and Widget Builder provides dashboard widgets, and the two of them said no. <laughs> Ugly. One of those kind of things that sometimes happens with plugins, unfortunately. I just got to remember where it is. I think it's in settings. Yeah, it's in settings, client dash. Okay. So in here, you have the ability to set up pages, which are what those big gigantic blocks were on your dashboard. Um, you have the ability to modify the menus. This is what I thought was the most powerful. So like I created a menu called contributor, and I can go in here and I can, and this menu is... This <laughs> down the side. That menu you're looking at right there is not the menu on the front end. That's the menu over here. So I can go in and I can turn off anything. I can remove it from the list. I can give it a special style. I can give it a special dash icon. I can do... It's incredibly powerful being able to create a specific menu for a specific role. Uh, I find this much easier to use than Admin Menu Editor. Because I've used Admin Menu Editor. I've used Adminize. And they're a mess. They really are. And Admin Menu Editor hasn't been updated in like six months, I think. Admin Eyes got updated recently. It just I don't like the way it works. I, I like being able to really control all that over there without having to do a lot of code. Now, I'm going to tell you, you can completely customize this thing over here, the dashboard, the entire back end with code. You can. I don't know how to do it. <laughs> I could go look and see how to do it. I could go research it. I hate doing that. It's a lot of work. And you have to do it for every site you come into. Um, but if you've got things that work for you, there's no reason not to do that. And what you would end up doing is, is if you're going to write those in code, you write them as a plugin that's a must-use plugin. It's in the MU plugins folder. And that becomes a plugin that you put on that site that the client cannot ever deactivate. And it replaces uh, specific functionality on the site. It's not at the theme level. It's not in your functions.php. It needs to be an actual plugin 
on the site so that it can't be turned off by the client when they change themes. Does that make sense? But that's all code based. There are lots of documents out there. Trying to find it on WordPress website drives me crazy. I have done research trying to find out how do I add a dashboard widget? How do I modify the dashboard you know, on WordPress codecs? I'll search forever and can't find anything. I'll go to Stack Overflow, I'll go to Stack Exchange, and I'll get some good examples, but I'll also get 17 other examples that aren't exactly what I'm looking for. And, I'm, and then you're just like going, can't you just tell me how to write one little thing to put that one little widget on that one little dashboard and turn all these other ones off? Lots of stuff about how to turn all the widgets off. Not a lot of stuff about how to add new stuff to the dashboard. So, or how to modify the menu easily. Uh, the menu editor, the, DAF, the, the, the admin menu editor for WordPress sucks. <laughs> and their documentation for it is horrible because it's all based on numbers and it's based on like users is 10 and, or 99 and the number for comments is like 17 and you give it a specific number and that determines where it is in the menu. It's a mess. It is like badly, badly, badly. Mess. It's, as, it's as much a mess as the back end uh, uh, text editor, the post editor. So, but that's the kind of idea is that when you're looking at plugins, you want, sorry about that. <laughs> when you're looking at plugins, you're looking for ones that work with WordPress, but also give you quite a bit of control. Uh, but realize that anything you do like this, especially anything in the roles and user capabilities area, you can completely hose a site by, based on that alone. Okay. Can you, can you show us some? Um... Oh, I haven't written the interface yet for the clients. I'm going to do that though. Or, or did you want to? Oh, you just want to see one? Oh, okay. All righty. I'm sorry. <laughs> she wants to see my workflow, my management. <laughs> so, like, I've got a pet sitting client come up. Uh, this is Event Calendar Pro. I've just extended it and I've linked it to a post type for pets. And this is my. Uh, dashboard for the client. I'm, I can't page down because there's information on there that's confidential, uh, but it shows a picture of the pet. It has my upcoming schedule with the client, and it also has like their contact information, uh, maybe the security code to get in their house, uh, the Wi-Fi for the network, their bat number. Basically, it's a nice little information block for me when I'm working with a client, and my goal is, is to actually create a dashboard for my clients so that they can log in and look at my available schedule post new pet, you know, because most of my pet sitting clients actually book with me the entire year in advance. Uh, they plan out their vacations based on my availability and that's kind of how we work it. But I want to give them the ability to go ahead and put in tentative pet sitting dates and stuff like that and give them a back end. So I've been playing with this one to work it out, but I, I just can't page down because everything below that is incredibly confidential. So, okay. Anything else? Yeah. This, this has a little bit to do with the members mm -hmm. uh, website as well. What do you do actually for security? Because you've know, obviously got more sensitive info on these sites because if you have membership. Well, if you're logging into the back end, you have validated you have validated your authentication to WordPress. If you only show the information on the back end, no one on the front end can see it. When you start publishing information to the front end, you have to have something that's going to restrict that content in between. So if the person's not logged in, they're a guest. If you wrap that content in a restrict content block or using members, you, I don't like that. <laughs> that's a nasty message. Let's go back to our keynote. <laughs> Here we go. Um, if you wrap the piece of content that you want to be confidential, and a blocker that says only the client and I can see this, then you protect it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Do you, you don't have any extra plugins as far as uh, don't need to. security or anything like that? I mean, you can. You, I mean, there's a lot of, I'm not going to talk about that tonight because that's not really what this particular talk's about. And I would rather have Chris Wegman come in for that one right. because that's his, that's his area that he really knows well. Uh, he would recommend WordFence. He would recommend, you know, the, the limit login attempts. And that, there's a handful of things that, he seriously recommends for hardening your WordPress site. Did you do extra for this kind of stuff? Yeah. For me, honestly, I, I use a limit login attempt. I put them on WP Engine, and like this website's local. No one's logging into that but me right now. If I push it out there, 
it's going to be a login only site. It's going to be, you know, like pets.gemtrue.com and it's only going to be login. So when they log in, they can see stuff and I'll be basically routing them to pages that are completely invisible to the net out there in the world. If the world tries to go to pets, uh, Tucker, they're not going to see anything. They'll get, you're not allowed to see this page or 404, you know, that kind of. Sorry? Are you using SSL? Yes, I do. Always. Yeah. That's uh, once I learned how easy it is to get it and how easy it is to set up, always, always, always use SSL on your websites. Always. It's free. And most most hosts give you a free certificate through um, oh, I don't remember the name of it now. I use WP Engine and they just gave me a free certificate. I'm sorry. Let's Let's Encrypt, I think, is the free one. But there's like others that you can buy a certificate for that are like if you're going to be doing an e-commerce site, you need to spend the extra money and buy a certificate that is you know renews every year, et cetera, because that makes your client your custom your clients customers feel secure when you're doing that kind of stuff. So, any other? <laughs> We're in questions mode. Any other questions? No, no, no. Okay. All right. Uh, the slides are uploaded. They're at jimtrue.com slash talks. What's my role? Uh, if you go to jimtrue.com, there's a link there called speaking and it lists all the talks that I do and all the slides are right there. I am Jim True. I am the support lead and community manager at the pods framework. Our website is pods.io. You can download our plugin at uh, wordpress.org plugin slash pods. It is a custom a content development framework for WordPress. It helps you grow beyond posts and pages. It's free. Uh, we consider it a, a bridge for you guys that are trying to actually build applications that are you know, useful for your clients so that you can get into that kind of field without having to pay any money. Because so many of the plugins out there to do powerful stuff, you've got to pay money to get into, and you don't even get to play with them first to see if they're going to do what you want them to do. And uh, we didn't want to do that. We wanted to make sure that there was no gateway that prevented you guys from being able to take your, your skill levels and take them. Um, it basically gives kind of like relational database capabilities to WordPress. I do a talk called Grow Beyond Posts and Pages. Uh, I'm hopefully getting a video up on it on my site within like the next couple of weeks. And I'll, uh, you guys can see that. And I'm happy to do that talk again too. Um, I like it. It's my favorite plugin ever. <laughs> And I'm not partial just because I work there. Um, I'm also part of Tampa Bay WordPress. This is uh, our Tampa Bay WordPress is our meetups regional kind of like WordPress community for, for Tampa Bay. We have eight regional deputies in uh, New Tampa, Russa Chapel, Newport Ritchie, Downtown, Brandon Riverview. It's all on our website. It's on tampabaywp.org. Uh, we list where our who our regional deputies are and what areas they, they fulfill. Um, we do our particular meetups here in St. Pete, the first month, the first Thursday of every month. Um, the meetups that we do for Tampa Bay WordPress here in St. Pete are much more business freelancer agency related. Um, I do not teach intro to WordPress. I do not teach any kind of beginning stuff. We will never do a beginning WordPress class here. I just not going to do it. <laughs> I'm not going to teach. I just can't. I, I, I can't. <laughs> you know, if you don't know how to use WordPress, get it. No, sorry. Mm -hmm. I, I love you. I feel wonderful for you. I think it's great. But you're not going to learn it here. Uh, I want to help you guys take your businesses to the next level. That's my entire focus of doing this particular meetup. Uh, we do kind of a blend of 50% WordPress tech stuff and freelance stuff. Uh, our talk last month was on speaking client, which was talking tech stuff to non-tech people. And it was all about the project workflow and, you know, explaining that kind of stuff to people. And I've got an answer to your question that you actually asked at the last meetup. I'm incorporating it into the video, so, uh, but I'll answer you. At, when, we go, when I stop recording, I'll, I'll explain it. So, because you were asking some very good questions about, um, in the project life cycle, how do you get that particular thing into the interview? That you do? So, and it was a good question. But anyway, ours are much more focused on business freelance and tech. So that's what these particular meetups are. Uh, we have a Slack chat, 
and we do a happiness bar on the first Tuesday or on every Tuesday between five and six on our Slack chat. So it's kind of like a genius bar at Apple, but it's a happiness bar for WordPress. That's what they decided to call it. So hmm? I can vouch for that one. Yeah, yeah, you were in. Yeah, and it's great. I mean, I uh, actually I have my Slack on all the time because I do support for pods on my Slack, and my, I have all of my little channels in there. So I tend to be always watching Slack, and I always see when a new message comes into our Tampa Bay one. So if you guys have questions and you need help on something, please hop into our Slack chat and ask a question. Somebody will more than likely get back to you within a day, if not sooner. So it's worth it. Um, we also have a Facebook group. It's pretty fairly active. Um, I try to like be active on there. <laughs> and of course, we're on Meetup. Uh, this wonderful place where you are right now is the Iron Yard St. Pete. And uh, actually, let me go get Catherine. Let's see if uh, Catherine's out there. <laughs> I know what <laughs> Catherine is the. Uh, get this back. Okay. Their next demo day is June 16th. So, oh, you, you are going to talk. No, I just want to add, there's food, so if anyone would like to come work, please come out. Okay, okay. I might grab something on the way out. Yeah, I know her spiel. Uh, Iron Yard St. Pete is a text. Uh, they do a very intensive program here in uh, web development, both front end and back end. Typically, they teach in JavaScript, Ruby on Rails, C Sharp, Android, iOS. Their website is, has more than enough information about what they do, and it's linked there as well. Uh, but their next demo day, where you can see what their students have done and uh, the projects they're working on, is on June 16th. It's open to the public. Uh, their next class cohort starts on June 26th. So if you are interested in registering with them and taking some uh, web development classes, uh, that's where you go. Uh, they're also on Twitter. So I love them to death. They're wonderful. They provide all of this for us free of charge, and they're giving us food. Um, you know, every month. And if I want to do more meetups with you guys, like if we want to schedule some more, she said anytime they've got availability, just ask and we can do it. So. Did you got it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's the last one. <laughs> okay, so we are done, guys. That was funny. Aw, <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs>